Welcome everyone and thank you for attending Start Our Demo Day. This evening's event is critical to the success of the Start Our program, playing an important part in the development of these teams into companies. Start Our is funded 100% through philanthropy and sponsorships and would not be possible without the support from the mentors, donors, and sponsors and community. Their generosity helps develop entrepreneurial leaders and provides resources to spur innovation and the creation of new startups locally and across the globe. A special thank you to this year's sponsors, Garnet Harriman, Robert and Julie Sullivan, and Procopio. Your contributions are invaluable. And now I have the pleasure of welcoming the MCs for tonight. Start our Accelerator co-founders, Lada Reskachova and Kim Davis-King. Kim is a lecturer at the Reedy School and an adjunct professor at San Diego State University. Previously, she was a partner with IDG Ventures, has over 17 years of experience in the venture capital industry, and is currently a partner at Launch Factory, a San Diego-based venture studio. Lada is a scientist by training as well as an experienced business executive. A Reedy alum herself, she has served the school for over 11 years and has been an essential element in all aspects of the entrepreneurial education and experience at Rady. As founding director of the California Institute for Innovation and Development, Lada conceptualized five business accelerators serving over 1,100 students. She has designed creative courses to introduce students to the most critical elements of entrepreneurship and innovation and has been teaching the venture capital management courses. Lada founded Rady Venture Fund, which during her tenure has invested in seven companies, including five startups founded by UC San Diego and Rady alumni, with two exits. Lada embodies the spirit of entrepreneurship and excellence in everything she does. And as many of you know, she's the founder and CEO of Dermala Inc. and successfully secured Series A funding. Lada officially retires on June 29th, so she can focus on her company full time. The Rady School is incredibly grateful for the legacy she has built here, and we wish her all the best. Please join me in a warm welcome of Lada Roskachova. Well, thank you very much, Dean Ordonez, and I would like to welcome everybody to 2021 Start Our Demo Day, the COVID edition. First, let me, let me introduce you to the SEED team. So in addition to Kim Davis King and myself, uh, I would like to introduce you to Karen Jensen and Diana Kay, who uh, make sure that everything runs properly. And as I would also like to introduce you to Professor Vish Krishna, who is the faculty director of SEED. Let me tell you a little bit more about the Start R Accelerator. So over time, Start Our Accelerator grew into a program of six different accelerators. So Start Our Rady serves um, predominantly Rady students and alums. Start Our Inclusion is um, used to be called My Startup XX, and it's an accelerator that focuses on helping uh, underrepresented founders and technology startup led by underrepresented uh, founders. Start our impact uh, focuses on uh, startup ideas that have impact in addition to focusing on profit. And start our veteran is, is for uh, founders that have veteran background. Start Our Teen is our startup accelerator for high school and middle school students. Our latest Start Our Accelerator track is Start Our Blue. And this startup accelerator is a collaboration between the Rady School of Management and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And Karen Jensen will tell you more about this accelera accelerator at the end of the, of the program. So now um, let me introduce you to Kim Davis King. So welcome everyone. I wanted to tell you a little bit about our program tonight. So each of the teams will have six minutes to do a presentation and that's gonna be followed by Q and A. And we'll take about two questions per team. So please put your questions into chat. 
Now tonight we have representation from our program. So we'll have start our impact, start our ready inclusion and veterans. So you'll see seven teams tonight present. Again, don't forget to please put your questions into chat and then we will ask those questions to the team. Now we always like to give an update on how we're doing uh, and start our programs continue to grow. In fact, we now have over 239 teams. We have lots of help. Um, thank you to the community. So 70 mentors. I know a lot of the mentors are here tonight. And then in total, this number has now jumped even during COVID, we've raised a total of $158 million of funding for the startups. 15 of those companies also have gone on to go on to other business accelerators like Evo Nexus and Techstars and StartX. And then we've also had four exits of so four companies who have um, been acquired. Three of those have been invested in by the Rady Venture Fund. And we also now have serial entrepreneurs. So starter alumni, seven of those alumni have gone on to create their second company. I also want to congratulate um, a few of our companies. One, Sierra Guitars, which successfully raised over a million dollars in a WeFunder campaign, as well as we've had Clarify, who did a name change. They're now known as Zero Go Health. And tonight, we will be hearing from Nevega, which is one of San Diego's cool companies. So I'd like to introduce to the stage one of our alumni. Anna was part of Start Our Inclusion, which was um, previously called My Startup XX. Um, she's going to give you an update about what she has been doing as she's grown her startup since graduating from Start Our. Thank you, Kim, for the kind introduction. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Moreno, I'm CEO of Covara Navega Therapeutics. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, my company, Navega Therapeutics, is focused on developing next generation gene and cell therapies via epigenome targeting. And really our mission is to tackle common disease and importantly, to bring down the pricing of gene therapies so that these can actually treat a lot more patients. Our approach is via targeted epigenome regulation. We use both tunable CRISPR and single finger epigenome regulators. Our applications in the gene therapy space are focused on in vivo multiplex gene regulation, and in cell therapy are on in vivo cellular reprogramming. And our entry strategy is focused on common diseases that are also rare. Some quick highlights in the company. We're the first company on epigenome targeting for gene and cell therapeutics. We have an established technology platform backed by pioneering publications and deep R&D pipelines, as well as proof of concept now for multiple diseases and over $5 million in non dilutive funding. And we really have an amazing team. I have a PhD from the University of California, San Diego in bioengineering in Dr. Prashant Molly's lab. They are focused on developing a platform going beyond the traditional CRISPR-Cas9 system to now enable genome regulation. I was a co-inventor of multiple patents that then I licensed to Navega Therapeutics. Fernando Aleman is, the P is a co-founder and CSO. He has a background in pharmacology and immunology. And the third co-founder, Prashant Molly, is a scientific uh, innovator. He has uh, one of the first to demonstrate the utility of CRISPR-Cas9 in mammalian cells. We also have a strong SAB board, uh, including uh, experts in sink fingers, pain, as well as clinical trials in the pain space, and amazing business advisors that, that have run multiple gene therapy companies and are also biotech executives. So in the epigenome gene therapy space, our first indication is focused on chronic pain. There's actually 30% of Americans that live with some sort of chronic or severe pain, and this is more than people that suffer from cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. And sadly, these patients rely mostly on over narcotics, but these have failed us. Not only are they highly addictive, but people are dying each day due to an opioid overdose. We really are in dire need of new treatments for chronic pain. At Navega, we are developing highly specific, non-addictive, long-lasting gene therapies for chronic pain. Highly specific because we only target the gene of interest. Non-addictive, we're not going after the opioid receptors in the brain. Long-lasting, in a preclinical animal model, a single injection can provide more than 10 months of pain relief. And looking at the pain signaling process, they're similarly detected by neurons called receptors. These can initiate signals that propagate to the brain, and they're first processed in the distal ganglia located up and down your spinal cord before reaching the brain and being detected as pain. So we're focused on repressing genes that are responsible for pain signal transmission at the DNA level to allow for pain relief. And we're going at the target that's already genetically validated. 
They're human beings that have a loss of function mutation in a NAB 1.7 ion channel that feel no pain whatsoever. But very interestingly, the opposite mutation is also true. There are people that have a gain of function mutation in this gene that feel episodic pain and it's called primary thermalgia. So our first indication in the clinic will be focused on this rare disease called primary thermalgia. And then the same product can then be utilized for other chronic pain indications. Our approach is focused on epigenome regulation. We use the variant of CRISPR called DEADCAS9 that does not edit the genome and hence it's safer. We add repressors and design dyes to target the suspicious star set of a gene. This enables us to have less ironing protein downstream. As a secondary approach, we're also using zinc fingers. We deliver these via adenosine viruses, which are already FDA approved, and we have intrathecal injections to target the dorsal ganglia, which is where this gene is, is expressed. We actually have demonstrated the utility of this approach in multiple pain models. Today, I'm going to focus on chemotherapy peripheral neuropathy. It's one of actually the most common reasons that cancer patients stop chemotherapy is the amount of pain that they're in. And chemotherapy to treat cancer leads to this polyneuropathy that's characterized as specific to touch as well as the cold. So here quickly, we do a mechanical baseline in the mice using these filaments. Uh, then we give them a cyclopacotaxel, this chemotherapeutic to induce pain. After we confirm they're in pain, we give them an injection uh, with their gene therapy and we go back to see whether there's any change in the mice in the mechanical threshold. We have four groups of mice, including a group of mice that received no chemotherapeutics, so they're not in pain whatsoever. One with a small molecule that's used in the clinic, uh, pentin, and then our AAV9, either sing finger targeting 9.7 or it's controlled. As expected, uh, after receiving the chemotherapeutic, the groups of mice were indeed in, me in mechanical pain, as seen here. But very excitingly, the gene therapy here, as seen with the sing finger targeting 9.7, we see a nice reversal in this mechanical pain, which is more significant than the small molecule. We were also able to replicate this with a completely different platform using dead cast mice. So we have extensive data showing that uh, efficacy of down 1.7 multiple animal models is long lasting over 10 months of pain relief, highly specific. So unlike small molecules, we can achieve single NAV channel specificity. We're expanding into other targets and it's highly safe. Quickly moving on to cell therapy, we're focused on retinitis pigmentosa, which is an inherited retinal dystrophy that affects one in 4,000 people. It causes progressive degeneration of broad receptors in the eye, followed by abnormalities in the epithelium as well as loss of cone cells. But the big challenge is that there's over 200 mutations across 50 genes. So designing gene therapies for each of these mutations would be really costly and difficult to do. Our approach is focused, uh, one that can span all these mutations across these patient population. We convert mutation-sensitive broad cells to mutation-insensitive cone cells, meaning that by doing this, the, the people can actually have this long-lasting acuity in the eye, visual acuity in the eye. So here what we do is target a gene called NRL, which is a master regulator of broad cone photosensitive determination. We deliver either a Cas9 to edit NRL or a dead Cas9 to repress NRL. We found that both were efficacious. But more importantly, we utilize a retinitis pigmentosa model that becomes blind by day 60. Here we have our control mice looking at different markers of the eye. We then either edit NRL or repress NRL to reprogram from broads to cones. We saw that indeed we saw a nice uh, increasing the amount of uh, cone photoreceptors in the eye, as seen here. We also looked overall at the outer nuclear thickness, which represents the uh, overall structure of the eye, and we saw a nice improvement in the structure of the eye. And importantly, we were also able to increase and improve upon the visual acuity of the mice. So this is the first demonstration of crispr immediate epigenome regulation for in vivo cellular programming. And as I mentioned, what's really exciting is that this strategy can actually target a large family of disease with over 200 underlying mutations across 50 genes. So in terms of the corporate developments, we're focused on a pipeline on moving NAV 1.7 and just our retinitis pigmentosa program into the clinic, but we also have proof of concept for other targets in pain, and we're also interested in looking into epilepsy. Right now, we're focused on raising our 35 million Series A to push these two clinics into the, uh, two, these two candidates into the clinic, to also expand upon the team and build up overall our pipeline. These will include those doing studies, CMC or manufacturing, and non human primary toxicology studies. So this here is our fundraise, as I mentioned, $35 million to push these along to the clinic. In terms of attraction, we've got, as I mentioned, over $5 million in grants, uh, collaborations with the NCAT, with the NIH, some awards also for excellence in pain research. We also licensed our patents from UCSB, and we were featured by the NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins, last month as well. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Anna. Excellent presentation. And we're so proud of all the work you've been doing and the progress that you've made.
we have any Thank questions you. real quickly from the audience. You can put those in chat for Anna. Um, so we have one question and that is, is the IP for gRNA or how does that work out? Sure, so we have um, patented the method of utilizing this dead cast iron to target NAV 1.7 as well as other genes. We also have uh, patents for novel uh, CRISPR Cas9 systems that are immune stealth. So, those will be their, our own uh, CRISPR Cas9 systems. Additionally, the IP for, in terms of the same fingers, those patents for original patents for same fingers are actually up. So, we have freedom to operate there as well. Hey, everyone. My name is Tyler, and I am very excited to be here today on behalf of Synbio Energy, where we are repurposing biology to solve our greatest problems. And today I want to talk to you about something that we all use every single day and would be unable to live without it. So you all may be thinking, Tyler, what are you talking about? And all bad puns aside, we can see that globally, 80% of wastewater receives zero treatment. And this can result in a shortage of 40% in, uh, in water by 2030. And another example of wastewater mismanagement is a Tijuana River where the centralized wastewater treatment facilities are unable to meet the city's demands and this results in pollution and health concerns. Um, over here on the side, you can see a picture of the Tijuana River and how bad it can get. Similarly, agriculture has similar problems. So wineries, breweries, and farms need to meet state, regional, and county regulations for this water that they discharge. And for all of these problems, a decentralized technology is becoming more and more appealing based off of location, resource availability, and regulations. So in terms of some regulations that came out in January of this year, the Water Board has uh, new regulations for wineries in California, and it's requiring them to increase um, the treatment that they give to their water in order to, to discharge it into the sewer systems. And uh, a quote from a small Sonoma County winery was, they're expecting to pay close to $500,000 to become compliant with these issues and new regulations. Now here at Synbio Energy, our solution is a three-chambered bioreactor where we treat wastewater to create electricity. We remove salt and contamination, um, things such as uh, nitrates and phosphates, and we, use, uh, we upgrade CO2 into a usable biofuel. Our reactors are also scalable to meet larger wa uh, water volumes and they're modular so we can integrate them and uh, line them up in a row basically so we can treat more and more water and also become compatible with existing wastewater technologies. Now, our first proof of concept looks something like this. You can see one chamber for the wastewater, uh, one chamber for desalination and one chamber for CO2 upgrading. Um, we have more and more versions coming out as we speak. So we're, I'm always working on something new uh, until we get to our commercial product. So um, in terms of the market validation, we interviewed over 20 customers and um, some common themes came up and these were decentralization, regulation, social innovation, and aeration. In terms of decentralization, one winery had to pump their water uphill, which is very expensive for them. And they didn't even have their own well on facility. So for them being able to reuse their water in a useful way is crucial. We also saw that half of our customers were driven by regulation. So uh, things like the water board compliance are the driving force for these wineries and agricultural facilities uh, to upgrade their systems. We also had one expert talk about uh, social innovation where in places like Tijuana, there's no jurisdiction for wastewater treatment. So recommendations could be made to these communities, but until there's an affordable decentralized solution, uh, they didn't have any hope for successfully addressing this issue. Our customers also mentioned aeration, which is an expensive process in current methods of wastewater treatment. So overall, the pain points were resource availability, meeting local regulations to avoid fines, and the price point to treat water. So for our global market opportunity, our market size is 64.4 billion globally for water and wastewater treatment. And for our serviceable, obtainable market, we look specifically at agricultural wastewater and containerized treatment systems. And we saw about $2 billion for that market. From a bottom-up approach, we looked at that number of $500,000 for that one winery and multiplied it by all the wineries in California. And we can anticipate over the next few years to have a market size of $1.5 billion for just California to be compliant with these new requirements. So for uh, our competition, one project I want to talk about is Midas, which was a research demonstration. And what they showed is basically they can use a technology somewhat similar to ours to desalinate water to the point of drinking and do it in an energy efficient way. In California, we have two other competitors, Microbi and AquaCycle, and they both treat wastewater. One of them desalinates um, similar to us, 
and then AquaCycle solely focuses on the most energy efficient wastewater that they can. Um, and here at SynBio Energy, what we're able to do is treat wastewater, desalinate, create a biofuel, which can be used as energy to power the system and do it in an energy efficient way. So our competitive advantage is efficiency and versatility. Now for our goals as a company, we have three that line up with the United Nations uh, development goals. And these are clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, industry innovation and infrastructure. And with these goals, we plan to address our market by installing our technology at wineries and having reoccurring revenue through maintenance, quality control, and consumable products. We also plan to apply for grants so we can get our proof of concept on the ground at our first winery, as well as bring it to places where we can have the most impact like Tijuana River. Now this year we had some milestones and these were raising capital for a proof of concept, demonstrate uh, our reactors work, pivot towards winery and acquired a provisional patent for the technology. By the end of the year, we will demonstrate that we can meet the California effluent requirements. We'll finalize our first letter of intent and get this product uh, hopefully in the hands of our customers. We will participate in the NSF i and finalize our commercial design so we can actually have a product. Now, I want to say thank you for everyone uh, being here today and share us through the grapevine. If you have connections in uh, the winery space, let me know. Um, I'm Tyler Myers. I'm the founder. I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Christy Dykstra, and my two engineers, Gio and Caitlin, as well as all the programs that got me to where I am today. Any questions? Great, thank you, Tyler. Here we have time for two questions. We have one, is the recovered energy sufficient to pay for the cost of running the bioreactor? So that's one of our aims right now. So computationally, we've done uh, an analysis of the energy recovery from wastewater. And we can actually, from that analysis, expect to have more energy than we need to power the system. Um, but we do anticipate being able to fully sustain the system that way. And if that doesn't work out, we have solar panel designs, which will supplement that system and get the energy from the sun rather than the wastewater. And what are the challenges in scaling the technology? I know you have a prototype, but to do a scale for a winery what are some of the challenges you have to overcome? Yeah, so um, the main challenge is making sure we have to have their metrics first. Whatever the water discharge quality they need, we have to be compliant with that. And so long as our design is uh, well thought out, which I'm doing my best to make sure it is, um, the, the reactor will be able to be like copied and pasted. So imagine, you know, if three of these are in a row and it's not clean enough, then we'll go five. If that's not enough, we'll go 10. So we'll be able to line these all up to make our uh, customers you know, the most happy that we can get them. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim with Seder Investments, and we are a company that offers a service for stock market investing. Now, most stock trading is done by large institutions still, but retail trading has been on the rise recently. It's, recently. it's grown to be about a quarter of the daily volume in US stock trading. Retail traders are defined as non-professionals who invest their own money. And one of the, there are many reasons for the rise of the retail investor, but some of the big ones that we can point to are the fact that a lot of brokers are offering commission-free trading now. There's the availability of fractional shares and also simplified trading apps like Robinhood. So most retail investors prefer to invest in, uh, in a fund, which is basically like a basket of stocks. But some of them are what we call stock pickers, meaning that they are people who want to own shares of individual companies, like they want to own a share of Tesla or a share of Amazon or Disney. The problem with stock pickers is that they tend to underperform versus index funds. This is probably because they make a lot of poor decisions about uh, what to buy, when to buy, and when to sell. So. The stock pickers that know that they need help, they have a lot of resources they can go to. They could call into Mad Money on CNBC. They could start watching a lot of YouTube videos. But there is one thing that we do know that they choose to spend their money on, and that's these stock picking advisor sites the, where they buy a subscription. And it, this is similar to the service that we're going to be offering. So this is kind of a view of our competition. These stock picking advisor sites claim that they can pick better stocks than you can, because of their detailed analysis. Well, their analysis may in fact be excellent. The problem with that is that stocks don't always behave rationally. 
And anybody who's followed the news about GameStop or AMC theaters recently probably knows what I'm talking about. And listed here are some other examples of irrational market behavior. So during my MBA program, I came up with an idea for a different approach. I thought, what if we had a computer algorithm that could look for patterns in investor behavior rather than the focus entirely on fundamentals? This algorithm could then recognize familiar patterns, move early in the pattern and trade profitably. That's the competitive advantage that we're offering and what I've been uh, secretly programming for the past two years. This is how well our algorithm actually performs. The orange line represents a portfolio of stocks picked by our algorithm for last year. And the other three lines represent the big three major index funds. I'm particularly pleased with how well our, if you notice off to the left, how well our algorithm did during the COVID crash period when most of the indices took a major hit. But I'm guessing some of you are looking to the right for the final results and you notice you'd probably be saying to me something like, well, you didn't do that much better than the NASDAQ. Why don't I just invest in the NASDAQ and be done with it? Well, the problem is reliability. This is what the NASDAQ looks like this year compared to the other three major indices. It's doing the worst, in fact. But you'll notice that we are maintaining our, our performance. So reliability is a big factor here. This is because we're using a machine learning algorithm that's constantly adjusting to market behavior. So this is a prototype of the website that we're going to be offering to our subscribers. Once they get past the paywall, they'll get access to some of our algorithms best forecast. I'm thinking we're probably going to be offering about five to 10 forecasts per week to our subscribers. And you can compare that to the Motley Fool, which is one of our big competitors. And the Motley Fool only offers two stock picks per month. But besides just the current forecast, we're also going to be offering our subscribers access to the, an archive of our past predictions that the algorithm made charted against actual uh, price data. And what you can see here is that this will help establish a proof, proof of uh, efficiency for our algorithm and hopefully get some of our early adopters to really become early evangelists for us. As you can see, there's usually some price volatility, but the price does tend to settle into our price prediction cones pretty well. So our go-to-market strategy is we're going to start with some very simple, basic, cheap internet marketing. Although once we get some revenue in, I definitely like to move on to Facebook and AdWords and some of the bigger things like that. We're gonna keep our price cheap and we're gonna have lots of promotions. This is to get a lot of triers. We want a lot of early triers to come in. And we're gonna learn a lot from these triers and we're going to, the website will change, the, the graphs will probably change based on what the, the early subscribers need. We're gonna use agile development to quickly implement feature requests and bug fixes. And hopefully this will create a community where the subscribers feel that they're part of and help with subscriber retention. My goal is to have about 5,000 subscribers after one year in operation. And this is an idea of the size of the actual, the overall market. The, uh, this is why I see that carving out about 5,000 subscriptions is pretty doable for us. So in the long term, we can potentially, if the website is just really popular, we can just grow it, scale it, and go with all the, that. Alternatively, if we can use that archive that we created to establish some credibility in the industry. You could use that cred credibility to start a hedge fund, to sell the business to a large financial institution, or even license the algorithm out to other companies. I'm the company founder and the inventor of the algorithm, and I'm definitely looking to grow the team at this point. Primarily, I'm looking for a web developer to help out because HTML is really not my forte, and that, would help, that person would help me focus entirely on the algorithm. I'm also looking for somebody to help with the marketing. I'd also be interested in starting conversations with curious investors. Uh, at the very least, I can put you folks on our mailing list. So that's our presentation. Thank you for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions. Well, thank you very much. We have several questions. So for example, one of the questions is, if you have such a great algorithm, why don't you just raise some fund and put the money, put the capital to work rather than offering this as a service. That's 
a great question. And it's one of the, the first things I looked into when I came up with this idea. And unfortunately, the funds are extremely costly in order to get the, the Security Exchange Commission regulates them heavily. And so there's a lot of compliance fund, the, uh, fees that are required in order to make it. So in order to offer it as a fund, you'd really have to have a large institutional backing, backing and a, a record of credibility. We've got to build that record of credibility. Like I said, maybe we, one day we can go to a fund, but like Motley Fool, for example, has been in business for 10 years. We need some kind of track record that can compare to that before we're ready to go to the fund space. So that was one of the pivots I had to do early on was to try to get the credibility through the website first. Great question. Well, thank you. And another question is, do you know what parameter in your machine learning algorithm explains the outperformance? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Do you know which parameters that you inputted into your machine learning oh. algorithm would explain the outperformance? Okay, yeah, Th that's, uh, that's actually part of the secret recipe and I can't really share that because <laughs> you, you can't patent an algorithm. So I really got to keep that a trade secret. But uh, if you're interested in some more data, uh, please feel free to email me. I can definitely follow up with that person. So hi everyone. We are Genomo, a social marketplace for genetics, genomics, and bioinformatics solutions. And our mission is to accelerate research and development by helping scientists order biotech services from highly qualified providers around the world. Before we start, let me quickly introduce to our team. My name is Nixa Spinola. I'm a patent holder and award-winning UX designer with 13 years of experience in product development. Hi, and I'm Dr. Megha Ghildiyal, a Rady Flex Weekend 22 MBA student and a scientist with 16 years of experience in genomic, genetic, and biochemical research. In my career, I have seen genetics and genomics become integral to our lives in countless ways, as they radically impact how we advance our healthcare systems, our food supplies, and ecosystems. However, despite the advances, scientists studying genetics and genomics are facing two big challenges the high cost associated to experimentation and the lack of technology, infrastructure, or expertise is forcing busy and resource limited scientists to outsource their projects to third party providers. Our interviews with researchers also highlighted the second challenge, which is that choosing the right supplier is often inconvenient and time consuming and can take up to 60 days. So currently there is no collaborative expert supported user friendly way to research, compare and order genetics, genomics and bioinformatics labor and supplies. And that's why we're building a one stop shop marketplace for biotech solutions where users can save money when outsourcing their experiments, make money when providing expertise, but most importantly, they can drive innovation through collective wisdom and collaboration. At Genoma, we truly believe that collaboration is fundamental to scientific advancement. And our mission and vision is to become the largest AI powered social marketplace for biotech solutions. We will foster a community where researchers can collaborate and seek expertise from each other or from our in-house experts. Now, how does Genoma work? When a user comes to our website, they can post a service request, which is basically a description of the project or the experiment that they would like to outsource. These requirements can be posted publicly or privately. If done publicly, anyone in the community can um, suggest a matching solution, including the service providers themselves who can bid on the project. If done privately, however, our platform will be matching customers to providers. We will do this first manually as we're building our um, providers network, and then we will move into AI and machine learning to support our efforts. Once a project is matched with the best prospects, the customer will choose a provider, they will pay for the job, and they will get the results through our platform. Currently, we do have an MVP in place at genomo.io, and it is a concierge type of service where users describe their projects and submit a request for quotes or assistance. We then provide them with a shortlisted match of suppliers that can meet their needs. And eventually our MVP will incorporate an automated payment systems. 
but right now we're working on it. Now, while the majority of our competitors offer a traditional marketplace based on catalogs that showcase prices and description, all of them lack the social aspect that is key to our target audience. We position ourselves as a one-stop shop marketplace for the scientific community that will make discovering biotech solutions easy, fun, and collaborative. We see our competitive advantages as being the first social marketplace dedicated to genetics, genomics, and bioinformatics. At Genomo, we will provide researchers with a platform where they can collaborate and seek out advice, expertise, and solutions through the Genomo community or through our in-house experts. We will have a killer UX that will make the platform easy and fast to use, allowing our users to seamlessly place orders with us. The global genomics market will be 27 billion by 2025 and is expected to grow 7.7% annually. Genomics is increasingly adopted in cancer diagnostic, vaccine development, disease tracking. We expect additional researchers and small labs will enter the scientific arena. We estimate that customers are willing to pay 5% service fee. And once demand has been established, we estimate that suppliers wishing to have access to this demand will be willing to pay a 10 to 20% commission. Genomo's strategy significantly reduce the barrier to entry for several small players and will also be the first of its kind in its target market. By entering the market as a dominant firm, Genomo will have a distinct advantage. We can segment and target the Genomo customer base as those who are seeking education and expert advice, those ordering services, customers who want to connect and expand their network, and customers who are searching and comparing suppliers with service providers. The revenue from the different segments will be generated using either service fees, commissions, subscriptions, and or advertisements. Our go-to-market strategy will use our MVP to test and validate demand and market fit, develop social and collaboration tools to foster community, promote Genomo on social media channels, as well as live events, such as conferences, workshop, talks, et cetera, build strategic partnerships with other scientific sites and forums, and grow our service provider network through an early adopters program to capture small and medium-sized facilities. Currently, Genomo is in early stage of development. We would love to have a developer and a marketing help on our team. We are also seeking angel investors. We hope to launch our MVP and test market fit by late 2021. And thank you for your time and thanks to Start Our Ready team for this opportunity. Please feel free to contact me or Nixa if you have any questions. Thank you, Genoa. Let's have some questions from the audience. What did you learn so far from the prototype that you have on your website of the concierge? Yeah, we have been learning a lot of things. Um, the first and I guess the principal one would be that um, we still need to validate our, our concept a little bit more. Uh, we do have some prospects and people that are interested in our project. Um, but I don't, we don't know if, if this is going to be sustainable. That's why we want to really um, test the, the waters and, and do more research with our potential customers so we can actually validate a uh, market fit. And hopefully we will have that answer by the end of this year. And how is the uh, community curated and validated? Yeah, we started a, a group not long ago um, on Facebook, actually, that grew in for, from zero to 1,700 people in a matter of three months. Um, we, have been, um, we have been sharing mostly content that are related to genetics and genomics as a hook for them to start a conversation. And from that group, we have been learning a lot, especially from the provider side as well, because naturally the the group on facebook become, became kind of the marketplace where providers are offering courses or workshops or even their own services so we have been learning and a lot from from that um, group and last question what is your strategy for preventing consumers um, to connecting to the suppliers outside of the marketplace after they've been matched right that is a great question this is something that we're still working on it um, but our strategy will be to focus on services and kind of hide at the first time or 
when you go into the site, you're not going to see the name of the provider right away. You will be disclosed that information later on the process. So the user will be invested already in the process and hopefully they will, um, they will see our user experience to be seamless and therefore they will stay in the, in the website and purchase the, the service with us. But that's a great question. To also add, I think the social aspect of it, we are hoping that the user sees it as a value that only we can provide to them. Hello, uh, my name is Elizabeth Broom. And it's my pleasure to talk to you today about distributed hematology, my business idea that needs partners and funding. Until recently, I was clinical professor and director of the hematology laboratories at the University of California, San Diego. I left partly to pursue this business idea. Uh, here is a picture of me using a traditional microscope in the Moore's Cancer Center. The Cancer Center didn't have a clinical laboratory, but using digital equipment uh, imaging devices, such as the one pictured on the right, I was able to view and interpret blood, blood smears and body fluids from sites that were many miles away from um, my office. <clears throat> this experience inspired my idea of bringing uh, verification of hematology results through digital imaging uh, to the large market of small to medium sized laboratories. Uh, through clinical trials and um, financial analysis, I was able uh, to publish in prestigious journals and present at international meetings on the subject of how to use digital imaging in the hematology laboratories to reduce costs and improve quality. Here is one of my um, references. First, I would like to give you a quick overview of hematology testing and digital imaging versus regular microscopy for blood smears. Clinical laboratory tests are critical for the majority of diagnoses and hematology tests are the most frequently ordered initial tests. They include blood counts such as red cells, white cells, and platelets, along with interpretation of various abnormalities of these cells usually by reviewing a blood smear, such as the one shown on the left, which shows two uh, white cells and a bunch of um, red cells. Blood cells have many different categories and abnormal appearances, and digital imaging devices take pictures of the different cells and with artificial intelligence, arrange them into different categories for easy re review, either in the laboratory or from remote sites. On the right is an example of a display from a digital microscopic imaging device designed specifically for blood smear review. To illustrate the importance of digital hemat uh, sorry, distributed hematology, I would like to tell you about a um, case that uh, was reported in the New York Times concerning um, care in a physician office versus in the emergency room. A 12-year-old boy cut his arm. The next day he was vomiting and feverish. His pediatrician sent him to the emergency room where tests were drawn, but the results were not fully reviewed before he was sent home with a diagnosis of a stomach bug. The next night he was back in the hospital, his organs failing. Only then did someone pay attention to the hematology results from the previous day, which showed extraordinarily high levels of white cells, a sign that he had serious infection. In this case, distributed hematology would have allowed testing to be performed in the physician's office, uh, reducing the time to diagnosis, the trauma of waiting in an emergency room with a sick child, and the chances of medical error due to the chaos associated with emergency services. Testing at small laboratories is more expensive because there's less automation and load balancing for skilled personnel is difficult. Distributed hematology would bring the efficiencies of large laboratories to these small physician laboratory sites. How and why is now the time for distributed hematology? Well, the advantage of having the um, distributed hematology would be shorter turnaround time, higher quality results with experts available 24 seven. It would be less expensive than having experts on side, site and there's a large market with over 100,000 small laboratories. Also, the FDA recently approved two 
less expensive microscopic imaging devices. Previously, the devices available for blood smear review costed over $100,000. These two new devices cost $30,000 to $50,000, less, um, more than a good microscope, but potentially affordable for these small sites. <clears throat> the market size is estimated to be six to 10 times that of large laboratories. At UCSD, we did a financial analysis of our small versus large laboratories and estimated the costs of a hematology test at the small lab was about $40 versus $10 at the large laboratory. The difference was mostly due to the expense of having the um, skilled personnel on site. Using uh, the uh, assumption that um, distributed hematology would have a cost per test closer to the large lab of $10 and would charge approximately $20 per test. Uh, the projected revenue would be 25 billion with a projected margin of 12.5 billion. The immediate needs of distributed hematology are partners and advisors with expertise in clinical laboratory devices and business. Also important would be to optimize information systems for access to analyzer results, improving verification workflow, secure patient information access, and secure communication between clinicians and distributed hematology. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, and here's my contact information. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Well, uh, we have one question and that is, what are your biggest challenges and what do you do to overcome them? Oh, well, the biggest challenges are <clears throat> access to the um, decision makers in these smaller clinical laboratories um, they are in general administrators and managers in these physician offices, and they can be um, challenging to access and interview for getting um, uh, market information. I've mostly gone through uh, salespeople who are selling these digital imaging devices and have gotten fairly positive uh, feedback. These devices are very new in the market, so um, they're really in the earliest stages of being uh, marketed, but. I would like to pair this service very closely with the sales of those digital imaging devices. So that is the plan. Another question is how does the reimbursement landscape look? Oh, that's a very good question. And the reimbursement landscape is very much a um, ch changing environment, a changing landscape. Um, very recently, there, there's just enormous pressures on to reduce costs and I do think distributed hematology would be very advantageous, but it would have to be looked at in the context of overall costs of healthcare in that you would be uh, reducing return visits, reducing the um, emergency room visits. So, um, but there is a, a very um, <clears throat> strong effort to do um, overall cost accounting in healthcare and to view clinical laboratories as just another cost. So um, I would be happy to talk more about it, but it's a complicated subject, but uh, uh, if you just rely on reimbursement, none of these labs would be able to survive. I'm Brandon, I'm the CEO of Bombadil. And this is what happens when companies mess up cybersecurity. Uh, the general population freaks out, fills plastic bags full of gasoline, shoves it in the back of their Honda Civic, and on we go. Um, the problem with the Colonial Pipeline is they fail to realize that cybersecurity is a lot more than just technology problems. Uh, and they fail to really use compliance as a mechanism to improve their security. And that's exactly the kind of problem that Don Bombadil is looking to solve. My good friend Clark and I met years ago working for the Department of Defense, uh, and we share 20 years of cybersecurity experience uh, in the Defense Department. And what we're coming to market with today is a cybersecurity management platform for defense industry contractors. Over the last year, Clark and I have been consulting for these companies. And what they've told us is that they are incredibly frustrated uh, with how complex and technical and difficult their cybersecurity programs are. And what we realized is they're all suffering from the same three myths and the same fundamental problem. And so I'll let you know on a secret that Clark and I realized while consulting for these companies is that cybersecurity is not a technology problem. 
We think it is, but it's not. It's a society problem. And society problems, sure, they involve technology, but they also involve policy and process. Additionally, these small companies in the Defense Department think that there are too many security vendors, which is only true when they don't know what they actually need from the security vendors. And then finally, they're frustrated that compliance is really expensive and doesn't actually improve their security, which sure, that's true when they hire large teams of consultants uh, like Clark and I used to be uh, to come in, give recommendations and leave without actually improving security at all. So what we realized while talking to all these companies is that there's really no easy way for these defense industry contractors to manage their technology and policy for cybersecurity. So what Bombadil is, is an automated platform that helps these defense industry companies manage their cybersecurity to save them time, save money. And at the end of the day, the ultimate goal here is to boost their security. And the way we do that is we pull in companies' technologies and we pull in their policies documents. And if they don't have them, we automatically build legally enforceable policy documents for them. And from those two things, we extrapolate the critical processes that they need to implement in order to become more secure and put that all into a consumable roadmap that's repeatable and that they can follow every single day. And by doing that, by implementing those processes through the roadmap, they increase their security controls beyond what they ever had before and by extension, achieve compliance. So that's great, but who are we doing this for? Well, about 15 years ago, the Department of Defense started making rules requiring their defense contractors to implement cybersecurity controls. However, they never made those rules enforceable. They were all self-reported. So what we've accrued over the last 15 years is a massive cybersecurity debt. And that bill is about to come due in what's called the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. The cybersecurity maturity model certification is going to be a requirement for all Department of Defense contractors to achieve a certain level of certification in order to do business with the Department of Defense. So what that looks like is 300,000 defense industrial companies spending $10 billion of capital costs to get their technology and policies up to that standard. And that's just the initial capital cost. There's additional $6 billion in annual recurring costs to maintain those standards. This is a massive market that's about to become mandatory because of the Department of Defense's regulations and rulemaking, and Bombadil is standing right in the middle of it. So great, how do we make money in this? Well, we have three proof of concept customers. The first are these defense companies themselves through a subscription model signing up for our service. However, we're also partnering with security vendors in a revenue share model and the certified auditors who go in and audit those companies and certify them that they've achieved that requirement. So what that looks like in the beginning is a small non-recurring service fee scaling massively to that annual recurring revenue once we bring in the subscription and revenue share to multi-millions of dollars a year, which is all good. What are we doing with that money? So if we hit our model in 2022, we're looking at 2 million in annual recurring revenue scaling massively as we bring in that revenue share. Additionally, we're looking at SaaS margins. So we're thinking 80% margins here as a SaaS platform as compared to our competitors who are all doing the consulting model, what Clark and I have done for the last year. And what Clark and I realize is so much of those activities of the consultants is repeatable and is automatable. And so we are just productizing all of our consulting experience. And we're seeing success with this with a few of our initial clients who we were consulting with. So what are our current challenges? Right now, we're looking for beta users. We're looking for companies, defense industrial-based companies, who want to improve their cybersecurity. They want to come on board, test our platform, and achieve a better level of security than they did before. We're also looking for security vendor partners. These are partners that are looking for access to those secure uh, defense industry-based companies. We're also looking for industry advisors in both the cybersecurity industry, as well as the Department of Defense, who are passionate, like we are, about securing the Department of Defense. Because that's what this is all about. We're passionate about this. We spent our careers in the DOD, and we want to improve our security and our safety of all these systems. I'd love if you'd reach out to us, and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Brandon and Clark, for your presentation. Um, so our first question has come in. How do you balance helping companies manage their cybersecurity programs with potentially creating a how-to manual for criminals? <clears throat> Oh, that's a cool question. Uh, so a how-to manual for criminals, you, it sounds like you're getting at, if we create those roadmaps, it'll be a way for criminals to kind of walk through that process, basically a kill chain. 
Well, that's something that we can easily balance in terms of making every individual client have its own process that we hold in confidence. And that's actually part of the certification that DOD is requiring is a some number of technical controls to mandate uh, uh, securing that data that is being shared between companies. So that's all comes down to our internal security. And as cybersecurity professionals, professionals, Clark and I have started from a point of cybersecurity, a cybersecurity base within our own company, because we've done it, we've been security practitioners, as well as security managers in the past. And have you able, been able to monetize this? And what's the resistance in getting beta users? Yeah, so uh, we've monetized our consulting. Uh, we're, we're a new company, and we're productizing that consulting uh, activity. So we've monetized the consulting model, which is what all of our competitors are doing. We are, have not yet charged for our platform. We have a beta out there. Uh, we are getting traction. We have a couple beta users, but we're just looking for more. No real issues other than it's the two of us working full time, uh, getting these uh, customers and looking for more to help. Hey, hi, my name is Valerie Wiest. And I'm Amin Borumand. And we are the co-founders of Blunt, a breakup app. Blunt stands for better luck next time. Blunt breakup resources for men to blunt the pain of a breakup. All right, so to give you a better idea of what our app, how we envision our app working, we wanna share a video for you. The video is aspirational. We're currently at the wireframe and content creation stage of um, the process. Jason has a girlfriend, Jen, who he loves spending time with. They met on an app and have been together for two years. One night, when Jason is hanging out with Jen, she tells him she needs to talk to him about something serious. We need to break up, she sighs. Jason is devastated. That night, he feels even worse. His head hurts, his heart hurts, and he can't sleep. He thinks about calling his friends, but he worries they'll make fun of him. He thinks about getting some drinks to take the edge off, but remembers that the last time he did that, he ended up feeling worse. So he turns to the place where he usually turns when he needs solutions, his cell phone. Jason spends time looking at Reddit and YouTube, searching things like what to do after a breakup. And one answer comes up over and over again, the Blunt app. Jason notices that even the dating apps he's used in the past are promoting the Blunt app. So he decides to give it a try. It's easy to sign up and right away he has access to content, community and service professionals. After listening to the first training, he's already feeling better. And after a few weeks, Jason has healed and leveled up his relationship skills. He's feeling better than ever, and it's all thanks to the Blunt app. So what exactly is the Blunt app? The Blunt app is an app designed to help millennial men reduce the pain and healing time after a breakup. It does this by featuring an AI-powered, customized video and audio course, a private community for members, an AI-powered, customizable way to block the X, and a platform that offers access to service professionals and breakup support. The program is based on science-backed techniques for grieving and healing, like journaling, reflection, and meditation. The Blunt app solves an unmet market need, allowing men to heal from a breakup in a healthy, accessible, and anonymous way. So now that you know a little bit more about our app, let me introduce the team to you. Our team is made up of two people, myself, Valerie Wiest. I'm an MBA student, a serial entrepreneur, a relationship author, and a coach. And I'm Amin Boromand, a PhD student of computational science and an entrepreneur. Together, we have experience in starting businesses, technology, and, health, and relationship coaching. And I will handle the business and marketing aspects of the business, while Amin will ha handle the technology aspects, especially the AI. So I want you to think in your head, you don't have to raise your hand or participate here, but think back. Have you ever experienced a painful breakup? My guess is yes, and that it's probably not surprising that our research has shown that breakups are extremely painful for a lot of people. In one survey of over 11,000 people, breakups were 59% of people ranked breakups as on a pain eight to 10 on a painfulness scale of one to 10. And in our own survey, 85% of respondents reported that breakups were somewhat difficult to extremely difficult to get over. They also reported an average spend of $600 on breakup related services. So people are willing to pay to get out of this pain. 
And on average, it took about seven and a half months to heal from a breakup based on our survey. It's estimated that 25,000 Americans break up each day. So if we estimate that each of these people is spending about $600 on breakup related services, that's a $5.5 billion market. Our app targets millennial men who are employed and who have been broken up with within the last year. That's a total market size of 4.4 million people. We estimate that we can capture about 10% of this market, which is a total market size of 440,000 people. So right about now, you're probably wondering the main question that we get asked when we present our app, which is why men? Well, we have three main reasons for targeting men with this app. The first reason is that there are currently only a handful of breakup apps out there. And all of them either target women or are non-gender specific. And for the ones that are non-gender specific, they have many critical reviews from male users saying that they don't feel included. By creating this breakup app targeting men, we're accessing a blue ocean market, a market that hasn't been tapped yet. In addition, according to a Harvard study, men tend to use less healthy coping mechanisms when it comes to dealing with the pain of a breakup, such as substance abuse. In addition, according to a Stanford study, men had higher rates of suicidality after a breakup. And then finally, men dominate the dating app scene with as much as 73% of users on dating app sites being made up of men. So for relationships that start on an app, we think the next natural step is a breakup app. And we have reason to believe that men will appreciate the anonymity and accessibility of being able to heal from a breakup on an app based on our surveys and interview data. So let's look at the competitors out there. As I mentioned, we only have a handful of breakup apps that exist, and none of them offer the comprehensive solution that Blunt offers. Furthermore, some of, none of them target men. We plan to secure a competitive advantage by targeting men with a first mover's advantage. And we also plan to create innovative courts content that can't be copied as well as patentable AI technology. Our business model is a two-sided marketplace. Users will pay a subscription fee and be offered a freemium trial. Service providers will pay a subscription fee as well to be featured on the platform. Our go-to-market strategy, as you saw in the video, is to promote the app through things like an email list that I've established over the years through my coaching clients and through the readers of my books, PR by getting articles written about our app on sites that men frequent like askmen.com, social media ads, some of which we've already tested out on sites like Reddit and Facebook, content marketing, we plan to create a blog and a podcast to put out more information and to further solicit users and also a YouTube channel. Partnerships. We plan to partner with a dating app and also other men support groups and potentially college campus mental health services. And then finally, we plan to host events like men's support groups for breakups and also speed dating. So thank you for watching our presentation. Our next step is to create our MVP. For this, we're asking for $6,000. And we're also interested in advisors in the mental health and tech space. If you meet either one of those criteria, please reach out to Amin or I at our email address, info at bluntapp.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... We have several questions. How uh, could you speak more uh, about how your app is different from other breakup apps? Sure, our app comprises of a comprehensive solution. So not only are we offering a course that helps men heal from a breakup, but also level up their relationship skills. It also offers a platform that offers discounted 
or free access to service professionals, as well as a feature that allows people to block their act customizable way. And no other app out there offers this kind of comprehensive solution. Also, we have some technical aspects that we use AI and machine learning approach to predict emotional and physical feeling of people after a breakup and provide them personalized services and personalized advice. Thank you. There are a number of questions and I would suggest that the people that ask those questions should contact you. There is an email at, on that last slide should contact you to get answers. But let me ask you another question. Do you think you could expand your idea to other um, features that not, not be just limited to break up services? Absolutely. I'm so glad that you asked this question because that's one of the wonderful things about our business model is that breaking up is a grieving process. So this model can be expanded to other types of grieving processes, such as healing from a death, even retiring retirees go through a grieving process and, and many of those can be subsidized through healthcare costs. So I wanna tell you a story about a store manager named Lauren. Now Lauren went into work every day and worried about the visual appeal of her store, what her direct reports were up to and the sales numbers. And then COVID hit and she had to take on many more responsibilities. One of these was to unpack shipments of new clothing that arrived to the store. Lauren learned firsthand just how much waste is involved in this process. Clothing arrived from suppliers on plastic hangers that were immediately thrown away, and then clothes were hung up on store hangers and brought out to the shelves. She was appalled at the pile of plastic left behind before the clothes even made it to the storefront. This is the market that we're seeking to disrupt, and I'll hand it off to Kim to tell you more about why. Thanks, Rose. I think by now we can all agree that plastic is a serious threat to our environment. 90% of petroleum-based plastics have never been recycled and they can take up to 500 years to break down in landfills. This means that all the plastic ever created to date is still in existence. Plastic is polluting our land, clogging up our waterways, filling up our oceans, and even ending up in the food we consume. If we care about our future, we have to make a change. The good news is that there are regenerative solutions that already exist and support several of the United Nations sustainable development goals, including the ones you see on your screen now. By leveraging the properties of ocean derived materials like kelp, we can create sustainable bio-innovative plastic alternatives. This is the ideal solution because kelp farming requires considerably less inputs than land crop alternatives like corn or soy. There is no fresh water, no land and no fertilizers. Kelp also supports global climate change initiatives because it sequesters more carbon than land-based plants. Caring about climate change and sustainability is no longer a nice to have for businesses. It's a must have as organizations look to reduce their carbon footprints and become better corporate citizens. My name is Kim Pendergrass and together with Rose Greeley, we are launching Algeon Materials. We're experienced business leaders in manufacturing, wholesaling and startups and we are passionate about the environment. You can see a list of our advisors and mentors on the side of your screen there. So like the store manager, Lauren, we saw way too much packaging being used to deliver our online orders during the pandemic. So we decided to focus in on packaging waste from retailers and consumer packaged good companies. We interviewed over 30 business leaders to understand why they were not using the alternative materials already available today on the market. Our hypothesis was simple. We thought it was just too expensive, but this was actually false. It turns out these companies were willing to spend the money on sustainable solutions, but the idea and the definition of sustainability is nuanced. Regulations actually differ greatly in the US from city to city. So even materials that were deemed as recyclable or compostable are still ending up in landfills. In addition, retrofitting an old design we found is 10 times harder than actually designing for something new. 
Our venture, Algenol Materials, is leveraging ocean drive materials to create sustainable solutions for these brands. What these companies need is they need access to materials that meet their CSR goals and business needs. The materials have to be environmentally sustainable in the truest sense of the word. They have to protect the product and they have to enhance the consumer experience. All right, so we are starting with the beachhead market of plastic hanger alternatives because the negative impact on the environment is actually large enough that it's something that we can have um, a great enough impact on. In addition, the product is end customer facing. So we believe that this will increase our opportunity to get buzz with end customers and we can be competitive on price. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Rose who's gonna walk us through our technology and business model. Thanks, Kim. So we're actively prototyping our hanger design. What you see on the left here is one of our hangers. Our material is lighter than plastic, which means it's less expensive for our customers to ship across the country. And it's strong enough to lift 15 pounds, as you see in this video. Now we've developed a proprietary formula and process to produce the material and then mold it into end products. As Kim mentioned, we're starting with plastic hanger alternatives. 85 billion plastic hangers are thrown away each year. This weighs more than every Boeing 737 ever produced. An average price of 36 cents a hanger, we've arrived at our market sizes here. And using Southern California as a proxy for the portion of the market we expect to capture, we arrive at an obtainable market of $209 million per year. You can see some of our biggest competitors in the hanger space along the bottom here, but they're just offering traditional plastic hangers. Our hangers are sustainable, they're conversation starters, and they're visually striking. So this is our business model. We purchase raw ingredients from wholesalers. We process them into material ourselves. And today we're manufacturing them personally, but in the future as we scale, we wanna move this to contract manufacturing and we will sell directly business to business to retailers. In the future, we'll add more product offerings and we'll license the technology to other manufacturers. Our next steps, we are actively prototyping with four local retailers. So we have our minimum viable product and they're going to work with us to make improvements. By the end of June, we expect to have strong signals that this is a viable product. Assuming the pilots go well, we'll hire a biochemist in July and fully develop the hangers over the next several months. Beyond that, we'll expand into new product offerings. Like our store manager, Lauren, many of us are waking up to the fact that plastic is piling up around us. Our waste is ending up in the ocean. Algeon's vision is that when it gets there, it breaks down and goes away. We're looking for additional retail partners who are willing to help us improve this product as we develop it. Join us in being a part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Al John. And let's have time for a couple questions. Um, one question is, so is there not any real sustainable competitors? the space that you're in currently? Yeah, that's a good question, Ali. I saw that on the chat. So kind of going back to what I was talking about, the idea of sustainability is truly nuanced, especially in the United States, um, which is where we're focused, or at least in North America, starting out. And so it depends on, it, it depends on what your definition is, you know, is that I mean it's made from recyclable materials? Um, has it had other lifetimes? Is it compostable? How does it break down? Uh, to kind of give a blanket answer, there's a lot of players in the industry who are doing different things, but nobody's doing exactly what we're doing. And we're excited about that too, you know? This is a, a true problem that we're facing, like all, all of mankind, our environment and everything. And so there's, a room, there's room for a lot of players here. So I hope, that, I hope that answers your question. And what would be the cost of goods sold in volume? Yeah, volume, it's a few cents. It looks like three cents in materials. And what kind of funding are you looking for? And do you have any data on biodegradableness of the hangers or any IP on that formulation? 
Yeah, there's a couple questions there. So we, we are looking for funding. Uh, where we're at right now is we've had some traction and we've gotten a, a little a little teeny tiny bit of, um, I'm gonna call it seed uh, funding to go ahead and purchase some more materials and do some more experimentation. Um, after this, this summer um, in prototyping with our partners, we would look at receiving a little bit more funding to go out to contract manufacturers. There's only so much creation Rose and I can do in our home kitchens. Um, the next question there was, what data do you have on the biodegradability of the hangers? So early, early tests that we have done suggest um, less than two weeks. However, again, that's, that's nothing official. That's you know us in our backyards. And then I'll let Rose take the IP question here. Yeah, so currently we're using a proprietary formula, um, but in the future, this would be patentable technology. So before we move to contract manufacturing, we intend to apply for a patent. Okay, great job teams. Um, we're gonna now have two awards. So Diana is gonna tell you about the audience award, but I first would actually like to congratulate two of our Stardar teams for the UCS San Diego Global Social Innovation Challenge winners, and that's Algeon Materials, as well as Jeweled. So they will be competing, representing UCSD at the USD Social Innovation International Challenge this year. Great, so now is the time that we're gonna ask the audience to participate um, and by, take, by selecting your favorite Stardar Company presentation by Select, selecting one of the options in the Zoom poll. Um, go ahead and vote for your favorite. We're gonna leave this poll open for about one minute um, while Karen will talk a little bit more about Start Blue and the program. Thank you, Diana. And thanks again to all of the teams for your presentations tonight. Um, as Diana mentioned, I'm pleased to be here to speak about START, the newest accelerator program in the START R program, this one with a focus on blue technologies. We are pleased to this program in partnership with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, our longtime partner in our annual Triton Innovation Challenge Business Plan Competition, uh, which has a focus on the environment. So this is a natural progression in our partnership um, and in innovation for San Diego. Um, applications are now being accepted for this eight month program that will feature both business and science curriculum specifically designed for our ocean entrepreneurs, hands on workshops, site visits to our program partners, one to one mentoring, facilitated access to potential partners, investments and customers. So after completing this program, we hope that our companies will be ideally situated to apply for next stage programming, um, which includes locally the Port of San Diego's Blue Economy Incubator, TMA's Blue Tech Incubator, um, and again, others throughout the San Diego region and throughout uh, the world. Uh, there's lots of programming out there for our uh, Blue Tech innovators. So again, applications are now being accepted through July 2nd for the first, very first cohort of this program. Um, programming is scheduled to begin in early fall. Uh, this program uh, is open to innovators from throughout the San Diego County region, um, including, of course, spinouts from UC San Diego. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, contact me um, or check out our website at uh, startblue.ucsd.edu. And we look forward to seeing your applications. We are going to give two awards today, tonight. The first one will be the ODS Choice Award and the second one will be an Excellence Award. So let's get started with the Start Our Audience Choice Award. Do we have the winner, Diana? You bet. So our winner is uh, Algeon Materials. And then our second award is going to go, and this is for the Excellence Choice Award, is going to go to SynBio Energy. So congratulations to all the teams that presented today. Um, again, thank you so much for attending this uh, Start Our Demo Day. We would like to thank again to our sponsors, to our mentors, 
and to all of the supporters in the San Diego community. We'd also invite um, any teams that would like to apply to the programs in the fall. And also if you'd like to support our seed programs, there's the email address for that. And then we invite all the audience to connect with the teams that presented tonight. So here is all the information in terms of contacting them via email, and you can also contact them via chat. Right, so thank you everyone. Um, also thank you to Karen Jensen and Diana for helping us put on this great program. And we look forward to seeing everyone in person in the fall for our next demo day.